Yeah, I think so. You're ready to go online in a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're ready. Good. Thanks. Hi, and welcome everyone to our second Unicorn seminar uh, this academic year, and also the final session of our topical block series on hybrid opto mechanics, concluding with a panel discussion today. As always, as audience members, please mute yourself in Zoom and turn your video off if you're not on the panel or don't ask any questions to save bandwidth. And if you have any questions during the panel, put them into the Zoom and YouTube chat, and we will forward them to the chair of this panel so he can ask the questions to the panelists. Before I introduce the chair of today's session, I would like to hand over to Modassa um, to advertise the next block of uh, seminars, next block of seminars we have planned. Thanks, Marcus. So um, very quickly, so the next block of seminars will start in November. Um, we'll share the exact mm -hmm. dates and timings um, in the coming few days and weeks. Um, it will focus on thermodynamics and its application within optomechanics and electromechanics in, in a grander scheme of looking at machines at the nanoscale. Um, so we have some very excited speakers lined up and, um, and the panel discussion as well. So I hope you can join us for that as well. Um, so thank you. But for now, I'm very excited to, to hear the panelists and, and the discussion today. So thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Madassa. So today we have the great honor to have Edward Laird chair and moderate this panel discussion. Edward is a lecturer in experimental physics at Lancaster University. He did his PhD with Charles Marcus in Harvard, which was followed by a postdoctoral research position in Delft and a senior fellow position in Oxford. Since 2018, Edward leads a research group at Lancaster University, which focuses on semiconductor quantum dots, carbon nanotubes, and fullerenes, and superconducting devices to exploit delicate quantum effects for new technologies. Thank you very much for sharing today, Edward, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Marcus, for doing an enormous amount of organization for this panel discussion, um, and also to Madassa for other contributions to Unicorn. Um, it's great to have uh, such a fantastic array of speakers to discuss this really interesting topic. Um, what I propose we do is to start off, I will start off by asking each of the speakers in turn to introduce themselves. So I'll go along in, in the order in which you appear in my Zoom feed. Um, Florian, could you start off by um, telling us uh, who you are and talking for a minute or two about your research? Hi, hello everyone. My name is Florian. Um, I'm currently at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light in Erlangen in Germany. I'm a theoretician uh, and I've been in the field of cavity optomechanics for quite some time since the early days. So uh, these days we are very much interested in, for example, how to scale up optomechanics to large scale arrays and potentially use it to study many body physics or study transport, especially also topological transport. Um, and we are interested in other uh, techniques such as, for example, using tools of modern machine learning in order to optimize such uh, photonic or phononic crystals that uh, come into play in such systems. Yeah, so that's in a nutshell what we are currently doing uh, preliminary, uh, predominantly in the field of cavity optomechanics. Thank you, Floria. Um, Yuen, could you um, answer the same questions about yourself and about your research, please? Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Yuen Chu. I am an assistant professor at ETH Zurich uh, currently. So my group focuses, uh, we're an experimental group. Um, we focus on uh, several aspects of optomechanics and electromechanics. So we work on, for example, coupling mechanical resonators to superconducting circuits, superconducting qubits, uh, using that for, for example, um, uh, quantum information and uh, study of fundamental physics. And we also work with optomechanical systems with uh, actual optical light um, and using that for, for example, transducing quantum signals between the microwave and infrared regimes. Thank you, Yuan. Uh, Peter. 
Yeah, hello everyone, uh, and also thanks for, for having me. So I'm Peter Ravel, I'm a professor at the Technical University in Vienna, and I'm also a theorist uh, working in the field of quantum, uh, quantum optics in general. But also, I think since my PhD, I've been working on problems related to optical mechanical systems and or mechanical systems and coupling mechanical systems to superconducting qubits or, or later on then to spin qubits. And I would say my, uh, let's say a main interest here is, you know, to use mechanical systems as transducers so to connect different degrees of freedoms and which we will talk about later today. But I think also as, as interesting in our systems that it can control, it can cool them, it can build phonon lasers. So also this type of kind of semi-classical physics where these optical mechanical systems are uh, very nice toy models, you know, to, to control them with light and having well isolated systems. So I think there's also a lot of interest in these more fundamental questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Cindy, could you please tell us about yourself and your research? Hello, yes, uh, thanks for having me as well. So I'm Cindy Regal and I'm from the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and I'm at JILA, which is a joint institute between the University of Colorado and NIST. In the context of cavity optomechanics, I work on membrane optomechanics. So using micromechanical membranes within my experimental group. Uh, we've done a number of uh, different types of experiments with these over the years. Uh, we use uh, phononic shields to make them ultra coherent. Uh, we have used them to study quantum limits to displacement detection in the context of uh, interferometers and radiation pressure. Uh, what are those limits and how can one get around them with squeezing, for example? Uh, we've looked at spin couplings to membranes. And we also work with Conrad Leonard's group on how one can think about using mechanical systems generally, in our case, um, in particular membranes, to connect superconducting quantum bits uh, to optical light. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, well, I think we should start off by defining the scope of this field of hybrid optomechanics. Um, so let me ask really everybody in the panel, uh, what is hybrid optomechanics? What sets it apart from conventional optomechanics? And what is it potentially good for? Um, does anybody like to speak first? I can pick somebody. Um, let me pick Florian in that case. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> um, I, I guess it's a wide field. Uh, so it's probably... Uh, almost everything uh, that goes beyond the standard setting of some simple mechanical mode coupled to some uh, simple uh, driven uh, optical mode. And I would say either it's new degrees of freedom that you bring in, or maybe also the interaction is uh, non-standard. Um, with the new degrees of freedom, I think we will talk about many of them, like bringing in spin into the mix and so on. But uh, uh, maybe others can comment on this. I, I want to comment on the interaction part. So for example, um, some of you may know that you can couple plasmonics um, to molecules, plasmonic resonances to molecules. And then the coupling is particularly strong, but also the peculiar properties of the plasmonic resonance are important. So you cannot just say, oh yeah, this is all, all my standard system and the molecular vibrations to which you couple strongly uh, will typically be uh, quite non-linear, even on the level of a few phonons. So that's in my mind already, even though it's uh, still only one uh, radiation mode coupled to one mechanical mode uh, because of the uh, unconventional character of the interaction and the unconventional character of the components, I would already also classify as a hybrid optomechanical system. Um, uh, same thing goes, there were a few um, attempts to uh, increase the optomechanical coupling strength, for example, in the context of electro uh, optomechanics. And you can do this by, for example, bringing in a squid or a Cooper pair box into the game. And then again, it's, it's not quite uh, anymore uh, your standard uh, cavity optomechanical system. And so um, what that also means from, from my point of view as a theoretician, is um, a little bit the universality of the description is lost. So in optomechanics, it was very important for the field that uh, many, many systems we could just treat with exactly the same Hamiltonian. And that also made a 
a unifying language for everyone. Everyone was talking about the same parameters and so on. So that is different. That changes when you move to hybrid optomechanical mechanical systems because the specifics of the of the interaction and the specifics of the degrees of freedom are now different. But that also makes it more interesting. There's variety and experts from different field uh, fields suddenly uh, start to talk to each other. Maybe I stop here and let others go on, but. That's only one small part of what, for me, defines hybrid cavity optomechanics. Yeah, no, if I could jump in, I, I, I sort of along the same lines as what Florian was saying. I mean, um, I, I think for me, you know, uh, there's sort of the the standard optomechanical uh, uh, interaction defined by some sort of Hamiltonian. Um, and uh, I mean, for me, you know, these hybrid systems is kind of about saying, okay, what are some additional ingredients that you can bring in that allows you to do things, you know, beyond that framework? Uh, for example, again, you know, like nonlinearities, uh, for example, in, in the form of uh, two level systems, spins or qubits, and, and things like that. Um, which also, you know, potentially result in a completely different type of interaction. So maybe just a more general way of defining it is, you know, some sort of interaction between a mechanical system and another uh, degree of freedom, essentially. Yeah, has has been said already. I think it's uh, easy for hybrid optomechanics to then include pretty much every degree of freedom coupled to anything that that one would be interested in. Um, but I think that one wants to think about connecting you know, surprising or disparate systems to some mechanical degree of freedom um, and also maintaining the, the theme of optomechanics, which is I think in, when we talk about the optomechanical Hamiltonian, right? In the end, we want the system to have some ability to have radiation forces on a mechanical device, right? That's one physical way to describe a, a bit of a theme. So maintaining that, but introducing other types of degrees of freedom sort of forces on, on mechanical systems. Yeah, so maybe you can also just briefly add on this and, and maybe from also not, not just, okay, what, uh, what do we call, uh, what is hybrid optomechanics, but also I think why it naturally appears. And, and I think this is really the, uh, the property of these mechanical systems, you know, they are big systems, it's not an atom where I shine light on, and, but the atom is fixed by, by nature, but the mechanical system I can design, you know, I can charge it up, I can magnetize it. Uh, so that's why it's natural system that couples to other degrees of freedom. While at the same time, we have these incredible high quality factors. So it's an isolated quantum system. So that's why I think this mechanical, it, it's really kind of an artificial quantum system that we're dealing with. And it naturally connect, makes a connection to many other, other type of interactions, magnetic, uh, optical, um, electric, and, and also, of course, uh, inertial forces and gravity and these type of things. So that's why I think is people are interested in this, this, this topic of hybrid quantum systems in general, which I just wanted to yeah, also bring in here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's a very good point. Thank you. Can I add something? Yes, please do. So yeah. I should say, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to moderate this, so please do feel free to jump in, okay, four of you at any time. Uh, so there's also the large area of what we could call analog optomechanical systems that share the same Hamiltonian yet involve other degrees of freedom. So one example that I know fairly well is optomagnonics. So you keep the light or the microwaves maybe, uh, but then it's a spin instead of the mechanics, but you can translate many of the concepts. And so uh, you may or may not call, uh, encompass that in the whole uh, scheme of hybrid optomechanics, but it's similar in spirit in the sense, now you are also playing around again with the degrees of freedom, but you're keeping some of the concepts of optomechanics. So maybe we should also <laughs> include that in the big umbrella of what we are talking about. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so a big question with, uh, well, I suppose for anything, but um, for anything hybrid really is, is to compare it, of course, with, with what you can already do. So if you think, um, uh, I think it was um, Florian who first mentioned the idea of putting a squid or a Cooper pair box inside, a, um, inside an optomechanical system. Um, if we think about superconducting qubit circuits, for example, circuit QED, um, they are already very advanced. And we know this because you can, you can build a small quantum computer you can manipulate quantum states with a very high degree of freedom. 
with, with sorry with very high um, fidelity. Um, and then you can think about then the optomechanical analog of this, which is uh, superconducting uh, cavity electromechanics, which I would say is simply the branch of optomechanics that deals with microwave light instead of visible light. And that's also very well developed. So you have two rival technologies of superconducting circuits. Um, and of course, in hybrid optomechanics, one wants to bring them together. So the question for you is um, whether mechanical elements can play a role in superconducting qubit circuits. What can they do that superconducting qubits can't already do? And I think I'm going to uh, direct this question at Peter, yeah, if I may. Okay. So yeah, I, I think that there are several aspects and maybe uh, even we'll uh, comment on, on some of them later, but I think one, one thing that comes to my mind in this, in this, in this respect from coupling to superconducting qubits is actually uh, one of the first papers I read in, in my PhD, beginning of my PhD on this topic from, from Cleland and Geller, I think. Uh, this was a paper about using uh, bulk acoustic modes essentially to, to store qubit information in the mechanical degree of freedom. And I mean, back then the quality factors, I think of 10 to the six were still, you know, at least for me, kind of unbelievable, but you know, nowadays, I mean, this is standard and, and we, are, we are much better than this. And of course, also the, the qubits have improved, but I think this, this, this memory element, okay, and this, this maybe is one aspect that we can bring up to having, uh, especially also small com compact memory elements, you know, instead of storing it in a microwave photon, which is really big, at the same frequencies, we have small elements and, and the quality factors are, yeah, I mean, can in principle be much better than, than the superconducting qubit. So in terms of small memory elements, I think this is one important aspect, at least that has been you know, proposed in principle 20 years ago, but now get okay, a field has changed completely. And I think these things are coming up now again. So this one aspect that comes to my mind here. Okay, uh, and when we consider the the, the value of, of memory elements in quantum computers, as far as I know, most quantum algorithms don't require long quantum memory. Is that true, or is memory an ingredient of some no some known important algorithm? So. Uh, I'm not, not sure if one can answer this at this stage. I mean, uh, so far, okay, with the qubits, you have to do, you know, as, as fast as possible. We, we don't have error correction. We, um, yeah, so let, let's do it as fast as possible before the qubits decay. Uh, if the, the algorithms get bigger and you really have to at some stage store some component and do com uh, computation otherwise, so even without error correction, then I think such memories can be useful. Although I think this is a, a topic, how to arrange it, you know, under which conditions the memories will be beneficial or where you lose and when you gain. Uh, I think this will, uh, I may also not the expert on this, but um, I think for some, some applications, they will certainly be useful. Um, maybe right now we still try to get your computation done as fast as possible. But as soon as we have to st some states in the circuits uh, you know, hanging around for a while, I think having these memories around should should be helpful, yeah. Okay. I guess quantum repeaters are the typical excuse, right, for having good quantum memories, right? Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I, maybe I, I should I could also um, comment on, on this. I mean, I think th there's somewhat of a uh, I feel like a um, you know, a fine line between what you call a, a quantum processor and a quantum memory, right? I mean, even if you're using sorting information for the purposes for the purposes of, you know, doing computations on it, you want it to live as long as possible. And and I, I think I just want to bring in another idea, which is that you know something that even within circuit QED is becoming important. It's this idea of storing information not in a qubit, a two level system, but in a harmonic oscillator, like in a, a resonator with many states. And, um, and that's an important idea for, for example, doing quantum error correction, actually, um, in, that, in that circumstance. And here, mechanical resonators are sort of an alternative type of harmonic oscillator, right? If you think about it, actually, I and mean, we have many different types of qubits, right? Like spins, superacting qubits, atoms, but actually in terms of harmonic oscillators, right? We've got electromagnetic oscillators and mechanical oscillators. And so, and, and they have very different properties, right? So as, as Peter mentioned, for example, right, the speed of sound is much slower, so the components can be more compact. You can have more modes within 
a single component, for example, and they can be uh, in principle more long lived. So if you combine those two ideas, the, the unique properties of mechanics and the idea that you know, harmonic oscillators are useful circuit elements sort of in general. Um, I think that's sort of where, uh, you know, those two things coming together is sort of where these hybrid systems become very interesting. Yeah, I think there's some, um, you might know this field better, but uh, there's increasingly experiments uh, yeah, using mechanical elements as a phonon substitute for, for photons and thinking about uh, connecting different superconducting qubits. Uh, and there's also a flavor of, I think Peter talked about early on in the context of just defining these hybrid systems that mechanical elements can have a certain spatial extent uh, that makes them a, a unique, as, um, gives them a unique flavor in terms of hybrid systems. Uh, just to give you an, an example, sort of taking this to an extreme of then talking about superconducting qubits coupled to mechanical elements, but then also coupled to, to real optical light. Uh, and, and that's another feature that we can talk about in terms of a hybrid system connecting to superconducting qubits. And there are multiple experiments uh, that are utilizing the fact uh, in, in our experiment, for example, where there's a very large mechanical element and a portion of it can couple to light and a portion of it can couple to a superconducting circuit. And so you're really bringing disparate elements together in a way that, that uses the mechanics in a, in a unique way. Uh, so, so I think that is one feature that, that really makes it hybrid and is bringing together different aspects of not just superconducting qubit to superconducting qubit, but superconducting qubit to um, optical photons that, for example, could be transmitted over long distances. Yes, and of course, that is a great challenge in, in quantum technology, and one that, as far as I know, can't be achieved using superconductors alone. Okay, um, now, this then leads us on to the next question, which is um, concentrating on, on optomechanics more generally, perhaps more optomechanics with visible light. Um, there are other quantum systems that you can add there, and we made a list before the before the panel discussion, so that includes things like spin qubits, spin ensembles, quantum dots, color centers, or atoms. Um, now, all of those, of course, can be controlled very well using visible light or using um, other, other um, technologies like other degrees of freedom, such as magnetic fields. Um, can mechanics play a role here too with these other kinds of quantum systems? And uh, what can it be? Yeah, okay, so maybe I can, can start here because, uh, I mean, in my group, we have been looking uh, for, for quite a long time now on, on coupling mechanical systems to spin systems. And maybe originally the, the idea was, uh, was to using the spin quantum properties, you know, to create uh, sh small Schrodinger cat states of, of mechanical superposition states to do macroscopic quantum uh, physics. But I think the motivation now changed really to, to turn this around and use the mechanics uh, to mediate spin-spin interactions. And, and I think this is still um, one open problem, or let's say that there's a lot of work on, on NV centers, SIV centers, and so on, so defect centers in general, which have extremely nice properties uh, in terms of manipulating the single spins. But so far, there's still uh, not a lot of progress in, uh, in coupling them in a controlled way, okay, so beyond two qubits. And, and here is, I mean, adding now the mechanical degree of freedom, you know, coupling them magnetically or maybe even by strain uh, can really, uh, you know, I mean, if you put in the, the numbers, I mean, because the, the experiments are, are very difficult, okay, so nobody has demonstrated spin mechanics coupling in, in a coherent way. Uh, but if you look at the alternative, you know, there are essentially almost no alternatives. There are some optics, which also has its own problems, but uh, in this respect, I still see that, that mechanics uh, can play uh, an important role to, to couple either mediate to spin qubit, uh, interaction between spin qubits, or also to have um, optics to spin conversion. So if you have spin defects that don't have an intrinsic optical transition, like the envy center, which, which now is also not an ideal optical emitter, uh, use the mechanics to store photons in spins and, and back again. So maybe for quantum repeater or some small computational problems where you need a little bit of storage, a little bit of, of 
a local control. And there, I think the, the mechanics, I mean, it's difficult. I think that's, uh, that's, that's for sure. But there are not so many alternative options. So here, I still think that mechanics can play, and these hybrid mechanics can play, can play a role in the future. Thank you. Yeah, the, the coupling uh, is, is generally, for, for many uh, types of experiments with spin couplings to mechanics, it's hard to make it as, as large as, for example, in some of those superconducting qubit systems that have been realized. But uh, I think there's a very rich history of connecting spins to mechanical elements from a perspective to of, of sensing of, of spins with mechanics. Um, and uh, there's a connection there that's not, uh, doesn't always have to be the cavity of the mechanical Hamiltonian, um, but could also be ultra coherent mechanical elements and how we've learned to make them ultra coherent over the years um, and, and many connections to, to different types of, of spin sensing as well. Maybe I can add something because you also mentioned atoms. And so we shouldn't forget, say, all the optomechanical um, systems uh, that deal with the motion of atoms, uh, let's say, cold atoms trapped in an uh, optical cavity uh, in a standing light field potential, uh, like the experiments that were pioneered by Dan Stenberg Kern, uh, for example, or Tillman Esslinger. And I would also um, subsume them under hybrid uh, cavity optomechanics because, again, this mechanical system now becomes very uh, peculiar because these atoms, for example, are moving in this cosine potential in the standing light field. They have large zero point motion. They become very nonlinear. Uh, they can also have internal degrees of freedom. And so that's, I think, also a very nice area uh, where you, yeah, of, of hybrid uh, cavity optomechanics. Yeah, maybe it relates to that actually. I mean, there's also some very nice experiments in, in like trapped ions, for example, where um, again, this idea of storing. So, you know, in addition to using the ions themselves as a, as a qubit, um, storing quantum information in the emotional states um, of these ions. And people have been able to create some very, very non-trivial mechanical states um, in the motion of the ion uh, itself, um, you know, which again, there's these ideas for, for um, using them as, as error-corrected um, memories, for example. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, right, okay. Uh, so let me ask another question um, about the relation to, well, to other branches of condensed matter physics. So Ewan made the very good point yesterday that in a sense, all condensed matter systems are hybrid because many degrees of freedom are coupled. And usually very important among those degrees of freedom is phonons, of course. Um, for example, um, they're a big channel for spin qubits, decoherence. Now, what optomechanics can do, and certainly hybrid optomechanics, is to create synthetic materials where you design the Hamiltonian to have a particular property of the material that you want to emulate, even if that material doesn't exist in nature. And one of the motivations for doing these experiments is to learn something in your synthetic material that you can then apply to your real material. Um, so, uh, uh, for example, it might tell us how to minimize decoherence, qubit decoherence in a real semiconductor. So let me ask the question of whether creating synthetic materials using hybrid optical mechanics um, can it teach us something about condensed matter physics in ordinary materials such as semiconductor qubit, such as semiconductor crystals? So maybe I can start. This is not even uh, really hybrid uh, cavity optomechanics, just standard cavity optomechanics, as you know, and principle has a connection to polaron or polariton physics. So. Uh, if you view the photon like an electron and then it uh, displaces the phonon uh, or the, it displaces the mechanical oscillator. Uh, so that would be a um, polaron state kind of, uh, especially if we uh, think of a situation where we extend this to an array where the photon could hop. Now the numbers maybe are not so good. And so I, I don't think anyone has really pursued this kind of quantum simulation of 
uh, polarons, uh, um, optimal mechanical polarons and arrays so far. But for me, that that is clearly a situation where you would implement a condensed matter concept in your synthetic uh, optomechanical um, uh, synthetic material. Yeah. Uh, sort of another example that I think is a beautiful interplay between sort of engineered uh, phononic structures and condensed matter physics is uh, Oscar Painter's work where they have very large coherence mechanical elements that are in gigahertz phononic crystals, where there seems to be a very interesting interplay between TLSs uh, and what they observe. So this is a case where sort of optomechanical systems and engineering of the mechanical structure, I, I think has got us deeper into understanding what's, what's going on there. Yeah, and I wanted to mention that also, um, you know, uh, in superreacting circuits, um, people are actually thinking about phonons as a source of decoherence, even um, you might think, okay, you might wonder how that even works, right? I mean, usually these circuits are made on, for example, non piezoelectric materials, but uh, there's this idea that if you have some defects on the surface that break the symmetry of the crystal, for example, um, you could still perhaps have some decoherence due to phonon radiation. And, and, you know, because these systems are already so coherent, right, we're really talking about very, very difficult to track down um, channels for, for loss. And uh, yeah, and there, I think some of the, the ideas of phonon engineering, for example, making phonon band, band gap structures and, and things like that, um, and, and studying how this affects, for example, the density of states and, and um, therefore the properties of, you know, all these different types of platforms, uh, whether it's, it's spins or, or circuits um, would be really interesting. Thank you. Uh, and, and maybe, okay, uh, following up this, I think, you know, uh, if you see this, this, this field of, of optomechanics or nanomechanics, uh, again, in the beginning, early 2000s, uh, I mean, everybody was talking about uh, clamped, uh, clamped beams and uh, Q factors were really lousy, I mean, compared to the day standard. And, and I think these, these phonon shields that even just mentioned, I mean, this, this really, so in the last few years, I mean, we've seen record cues after record cues and uh, on the archive. So it's, it's really, and, and you know, these techniques simply now work. Okay. And, and I think this, this could be now we okay. People are trying to optimize optomechanics and, and maybe hybrid optomechanic systems. But I think this could then be really be applied to more general engineering tasks and, and uh, in, in very various, various settings. And, and of course, this phenomenic band gaps, they make use of condensed metaphysics in some sense, okay, band structure theory and so on. So, I think there's a natural interplay here. Yeah, I think so. I mean, one thing, of course, that the lateral materials have that, that um, it's very hard to achieve in synthetic ones is um, an enormous number of, of different um, lattice sites interacting. I mean, Florian mentioned uh, the, the importance of creating the rays of, of resonators. Um, is that what we should know that is this what we should be trying to do to do more of? It's I'm very sorry, hard to make many resonations. So know. any experimentalist who does this is my friend. Okay, thank you. Um, right. Okay, let's uh, talk about other degrees of freedom. So as the name suggests, optomechanics generally involves light. Um, but we can think of, um, of other degrees of freedom that enter the Hamiltonian in the same way, such as bulk phonons. Um, are there other examples? And are these also part of optomechanics? Yeah, I mean, um, um, okay, so, so maybe some, something that comes to my mind in this question, I'm not sure if it's. Uh, correctly what, what you're aiming for. Um, but this was actually some, uh, some project we worked on, on uh, a, a while ago, where actually, uh, okay, we used uh, spin defects uh, to couple the different type of phonons. Uh, so on one hand to a floppy resonator, but the defects intrinsically also coupled to kind of giga, 50 gigahertz phonons. So that's these SIV centers, they have a transition which couples uh, very strongly to, uh, to high frequency phonons. 
And these phones are, of course, not, not so well controlled, so they act more like a bath. But in this, using then this defect, you can couple kind of low frequency phonons to the high frequency. So instead of having phonons and photons, you have uh, yeah, two different types of, of phonons, so kind of mechanical beams and more like bulk phonons, as I said. And we played, I mean, played at least a little bit around using then these, these bulk phonons to dissipate the energy and, and so sort of substituting them uh, for, for the photons. And maybe this is something that uh, I'm not sure if there's uh, many other ideas around, along these lines, but it, it's really as, as we get uh, even out of control, higher and higher frequency for, uh, phonons, and they are usually cold, so they actually act, they're almost like photons, you know, you can cool them to the ground state by putting them into the fridge. So I think uh, one can, of course, they're, they're naturally the coupling between different type of phonons, I think is naturally very, very small because uh, small nonlinearities. But then using this hybrid degrees of freedom, I think we can couple different type of phonons and you know, create some effective systems. And, and this may be some direction which one could um, more, yeah, more generally also experimentally try to, to explore a little more. But, uh, so this is something that comes to my mind here. Thank you. The work you're describing, was it purely theoretical or? Did it involve an experiment as well? Yeah, no, this was still pure theoretical. So again, this, this is some, some work on, on spin qubits, coupling them both magnetically and by, by a strain. Mm -hmm. And these ideas, as I mentioned, uh, I hope that the experiments, for example, at uh, Tara, Marco Lonka, Michel I mean, they have a very nice uh, phononic uh, devices out of diamond, which is a little bit the problem so far. So that the spin qubits were the best spin qubits were sitting in diamond, but diamond is, of course, uh, probably one of the hardest materials to, to fabricate. Uh, but people are now learning to do this. So I'm optimistic that we will see some spin phonon coupling coherent one soon, and maybe also in other systems. Yeah, but so it's getting there, I would say. <laughs> I think I remember, but I may be wrong, that Hong Tang also was thinking about uh, coupling different frequencies of phonons, and that may have been experimental, but certainly in the classical regime, mm -hmm. but I may be wrong, so I should check. Yeah, uh, I mean, I assume in, in a classical regime, or probably also quantum, uh, I think I vaguely remember something from Gerald Milburn a long while, time ago. I assume that, that there are some, some people have thought about this, but generally the, the interaction is very weak, the nonlinearities. But um, yeah, in principle, you should be able to do sort of auto mechanics, uh, phono mechanics, <laughs> actually, how to call it. Thank you. Now, um, we've talked a lot about different degrees of freedom. And every time we introduce a new system or a new degree of freedom into an experiment, then that's always very exciting because there's new things that we can do with that. Um, but of course, always when you introduce something new into an experiment, you introduce new difficulties as well as new opportunities. Um, and uh, so the big challenge um, experimentally is you know, when do you get to the point that the new capabilities outweigh the difficulties? Um, so perhaps particularly for the experimentalists in the panel, um, what are the challenges in reaching that point? And can you give us examples? Um, sure, no, yeah. Uh, yes. I can start. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I think it's just that, um, you know, in these hybrid systems, right, the, the individual components, people have worked long and hard to optimize them, to optimize in particular the materials and the device designs for that particular degree of freedom, right? For example, in a superconducting circuit, you know, people have come, you know, found materials at a very low microwave loss and, and things like that. And then in optical mechanics, you have other materials that people tend to use that have, you know, very low phonon loss or optical absorption and, and things like that. And so, yeah, of course, the challenge with is always, you know, putting these things together. And so, you know, um, sort of now we are interested in measuring properties of, in particular, materials that you know, people didn't care so much about, right? Now we would like to know the microwave loss tangent of materials that people usually use for optics, for example, for, you know, in terms of like transduction. Um, and, uh, 
yeah, and also, for example, piezoelectric materials, which are used for um, uh, for transducing uh, between you know qubits and, and mechanics, and and sometimes you kind of wonder if there is actually there are actually fundamental limits, right? For example, if you have a piezoelectric material that converts electromagnetic energy into phonons, which sometimes are phonons that you actually are coherent phonons that you like, but there's always some aspect of it where it's um, you know radiating phonons, which would just be another uh, source of loss. And so balancing those things and maybe controlling in, in terms of both the materials and the, ge the geometry of the devices um, to balance those two things, I, I think is sort of, you know, one of the, the big challenges right now. Yeah, one has to remember a bit in this field, we've become so used to a mechanical degree of freedom actually being something controllable um, within the solid state. Uh, I think one has to step back and say that's pretty amazing to begin with. And, and I think that uh, you know, the more that we control these degrees of freedom, I think the less bad things they will do to the system and the more you know, different types of hybrid systems uh, that we can make. And you know, from that spirit, I think as, as Yuban says, uh, you know, piezoelectric materials are very important and interesting material that could give you strong coupling to the superconducting qubit systems, for example. But there are also cases where mechanical systems can sort of free you from material constraints. Like everything vibrates, everything has tonons <laughs> at some level. Um, so the, there's a certain way in which uh, that's uh, a, a nice experimental degree of freedom. Um, but, but yeah, I think we've talked about some examples as we've gone along and we'll continue to talk about examples where potentially mechanical systems can surpass other types of uh, systems in, in certain problems. Um, but those problems are, are pretty unique. Uh, and I guess we'll probably talk more as we go along about to the extent we're solving them compared to other platforms. Thank you. Um, right, well, if there are no other comments on that question, um, then let's move on to applications. Now I know we've talked a bit about this. Um, so one really big motivation in optimal mechanics is sensing. So things like sensing small forces and then um, things that, that follow on from that, such as measuring magnetic fields or light pressure or viscosity or masses or things like that. Um, so a big general motivation in optimal mechanics is sensing. Um, can hybrid optomechanics help us build a better sensor? Since I touched on this before a bit uh, already, maybe I could uh, start do. out. I think one thing one has to be careful of is how much optomechanics itself is useful as a sensor. I mean, I, I think interferometers generally are really useful as sensors. Um, so I, I think that that's sort of the potential connection we're talking about. And, I think it's very natural for hybrid systems to, to be the place where we sense many different things, right? Um, you can attach a magnet, uh, you can think about just the mass of the object, uh, like in LIGO, um, you can put a tip on it, like in AFM. Uh, so I think in that sense, there are many different types of connections to, to sensing. Um, maybe let someone else jump in there and, um, yeah, and, and maybe if I can define sensing even <laughs> a bit more broadly, right? You gave many examples, um, but you know, I would also call sensing things like um, measuring more fundamental physics effects that perhaps are unique to mechanical systems, right? I mean, I think there are many unanswered questions in terms of, for example, quantum mechanics coupled to gravity and, and you know, mechanical systems are, are uniquely positioned <laughs> to answer that question. And, you know, I, I guess these hybrid systems are then a tool for, for example, creating quantum states of mechanical objects and studying how they behave um, and whether or not we can sense any effects um, of, you know, physics beyond what we even, you know, understand these days. So for example, um, the idea of, uh, you know, whether there is a fundamental limit to how precisely we can measure uh, the position of a mechanical object, so like at the Planck, the Planck scale even. And there, there are actually ideas for doing experiments um, to measure those kind of things. But uh, for that, we need either to make quantum states or to make use of the fact that we can 
use um, optical mechanical systems to do very sensitive measurements to try and, and detect um, those effects. So, yes, I think that's a very good point. I mean, and one one other um, proposal that I've seen for using mechanical devices for fundamental physics is even to use them as sensors for dark matter. If dark matter particles are massive enough, you might have some hope of being able to detect them just gravitationally, um, which is important because you don't know what other interactions they have. You don't know how weak those may be, um, but you know that they certainly interact with gravity. I'm um, sorry, was Florian about to say something? So maybe one can add to that, that the sensing area is uh, something where then the toolbox of cavity optomechanics really shines. So all the slightly non-conventional also sensing modalities that have been developed. So as one example in the area of fundamental physics, so um, if you think of a levitated system or just any optomechanical system, you cannot only sense the position, linear in the position, that's the standard thing, but you can also set things up just right so to, as to sense the X squared or the phono number, for example. And I remember uh, some very nice proposals from uh, uh, Oriol Romero Izar uh, saying, okay, but if you measure X squared then you prepare it in a non-classical state superposition, and that's what you want to do to test these uh, fundamental issues about uh, quantum mechanics. So this is where, uh, yes, you have your a little bit more complicated hybrid systems, and then you bring in uh, the ideas from, say, standard cavity optomechanics, and they are very powerful. Yeah, maybe you're uh, yeah, following up on, on this, and, and uh, I think Pete Parker is also around, and he's, he's of course here also the expert. So I think in these fundamental tests, also kind of combining these, uh, as on one hand, the optical component, I mean, for levitation, but also cooling the objects. But then once you have them cooled, you know, you still want to do something non-classical. And, and uh, uh, I think there are several papers around and ideas around to then use, for example, some embedded spin system or or something like this, which generates a nonlinearity, which can be used to create a superposition state out of this. And, and I think here that the combination of having some two-level nonlinear quantum system and optics and mechanics combined, I think here this is really, I would say, uh, one area where this hybrid character really makes sense and is, is useful. Thank you. Um, Okay, so now let's consider, let, let's talk about not, not sensing for fundamental physics, but sensing for technology. Um, consider an engineer in 10 years time who is uh, trying to look at what sensors exist that are better than the kinds that we know about already. So this engineer is looking at new hybrid optomechanical technologies that we hope will exist by then, um, and is comparing them with other technologies such as nonlinear materials. Um, will hybrid optomechanical technologies be superior? And if so, let me even ask you to propose which ones. I guess since we're talking specifically about you know, the comparison to nonlinear materials, I, I guess I would say um, that time is now a little bit. I think we don't have to ask out 10 years to ask, you know, if we're looking at different technologies and what we should invest in, um, how one thinks about the, the benefits of mechanics. I think that our field has been looking for ways that uh, mechanical elements could contribute to certain types of technologies. And to bring out one example that you and I have, have both discussed, this um, connecting optical light to electrical uh, signals or superconducting quantum bits. There's many different ways that you can envision doing that. And in fact, the normal way you would do that is with some sort of uh, crystal, right? That would uh, make a modulator like lithium niobate. And in fact, lithium niobate is something that people are pursuing at cryogenic temperatures as a connection um, between superconducting qubits and light. And is, and is very competitive, um, I would say. Uh, but the you know, people keep working on mechanical systems also uh, as sort of an effective nonlinear medium uh, in order to connect these two degrees of freedom. And I would say it's sort of a 
back and forth right now um, between you know pulling a crystal out of the drawer um, and finding the right properties and uh, making it work the way you want um, for uh, quantum systems um, versus trying to engineer something with mechanical degrees of freedom over many different scales. People are looking at this problem. So I think it's a unanswered question and you can tell it from the field, right? The people are pursuing um, this, uh, the solution to this problem with, with many different types of systems. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have a comment on that question? Okay. Um, well, in that case, um, since we're moving towards the end of the allocated time for the, for, the, for the main part of the panel discussion, let us talk about the outlook. Um, what are the challenges for this field? And what tools would you like to develop or would you like to see developed to overcome them? For example, are there other systems not yet explored that might fruitfully become a part of hybrid, of a hybrid optomechanical experiment? Or are there connections to new fields? Um, yeah, where do you see the field going? Okay, um, well, I can, I can try to start. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess, you know, um, similar to in terms of challenges and, and new tools that we, we would like that I mentioned before, it's just, um, you know, fundamentally, when you're connecting all these different types of systems, I think there is a lot of knowledge out there in each individual field, um, perhaps not even in terms of quantum systems, but even like classical devices um, that I, you know, I constantly feel like I, there's someone out there who can answer a very simple question that I have about like, how do bulk acoustic wave resonators work? Because, you know, people have been making these things and putting them in cell phones for a long time. Right. And, and I think just connecting the different languages from different fields and, and, you know, realizing that probably there's someone out there who thinks about these things a lot, just in a, in a different way. I think, you know, um, finding a way to, to, do that better and making connections um, to those potentially very different fields. Um, I think that would be a very important um, thing, you know, going forward. And then related to that, you know, maybe thinking about about you know um, objects or materials um, that one can incorporate that the you know uh, we don't traditionally think about in optical mechanics. So now, for example you know, uh, optomechanical systems that involve liquids. Um, you know, so there are people now working on that as well. For example, Jack Harris um, at Yale with, you know, superfluid helium. And uh, those could be really interesting systems with very, very different properties from, um, you know, a, a typical optomechanical system. Um, so, so I think, you know, those kind of new directions could be really interesting. So maybe I, I can just briefly add, I think it will be a very important step when um, people who are not primarily working on hybrid quantum systems, or they don't understand themselves as working on hybrid quantum optomechanical or otherwise quantum systems, um, but they are working, I don't know, on, on qubits or something, uh, that they say, okay, but this is so important and useful. I will, I will now have to implement this on my chip, right? That I think will signal some kind of success of hybrid systems. Then, I think that's very true. Yes. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, if we are about to. Uh wishing okay what we would like to see in this field <laughs> uh, i think it's now and, and now speaking as a theorist and i think florian will agree with me i mean a lot of this, this system right now okay uh, especially if you think about spin qubits or so i mean uh, conceptually it's very nice to couple mechanics to spins and so on but then in practice couplings are small and and you often have still have a lot of disorder and so on so i think it would be very nice to then uh, to get to the stage where fabrication-wise, we can really have uh, you know also more mechanical modes, with low disorder, so they can really then maybe a couple spins to them send excitations around. Um, so this I, I think is just uh, maybe superconductors. Um, it's in principle possible, but it's still kind of more like single devices. But I think once we are able to scale it, scale these devices up, I think then it, it's uh, it becomes a huge 
range of possibilities, uh, optics, spins, phonons, everything in kind of waveguides or extended systems. So, uh, so this, I think, will be a fun, fun area to play around with from a theory perspective. But uh, so if I want to wish something for the next five years or so, then <laughs> that's, there is a breakthrough in experiments along this direction. Yeah, no, you went talked about um, how it pulls in many different fields, the, the type of work that we do. And, and I think it's also been interesting to see the convergence sort of across scales, right? We, we work with masses of from very large to very tiny and you know, phononic crystals, for example, have been implemented across a lot of this range and I think continuing to see that convergence um, it, it will be interesting within the context of the field as well. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the end of the, uh, the slightly more formal part where the questions have been prepared beforehand. So we now move on to questions from the audience. Um, so we have two sources, one from the YouTube chat and one from Zoom. Um, if you're in Zoom, then you will be able to see the message from Marcus um, inviting you to come forward with questions for the panel. Um, I see there's at least one hand up, which comes from Peter Barker. So Peter, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, uh, thanks very much. So I guess um, one of the, probably the most obviously useful um, hybrid technologies is this sort of bi-directional microwave to optical, optical to microwave conversions. And I, you know, there are there are a number of, um, I guess, technologies or developments around that. So um, in terms of actually a quantum system where you might want to use it, for example, uh, you know, to communicate between, you know, quantum computers, for example. I mean, where, where does that stand? I know that there's approximately you know, fifty percent conversion efficiency. I think from is that from you, Cindy? Um, so you know, is that good enough to do these things? Do you you know, does it have a, a wide enough bandwidth for what's required? I mean, how how useful are they already, and how useful do they have to get to be well useful to to other technologies? So I think you and I can probably both combined uh, speak to this uh, question. And uh, yeah, I know it's, it's interesting that um, these, this conversion problem is, is quite difficult, but it's pursued by many different people. I would say the recent experiments um, from Oscar Painter's group where they're actually able to see uh, single optical photons coming out of a converter um, are probably the most advanced in terms of a, a quantum state uh, that has come out. Um, but then there are other platforms um, like ours with different efficiencies. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting that the many different platforms being pursued, both within mechanical systems and within um, standard nonlinear optical materials, you know, often they sort of, some are high bandwidth, but with certain types of problems, or low bandwidth without certain types of problems. Uh, so there's, there's many trade-offs going on in many different um, systems from megahertz mechanics to gigahertz mechanics to piezoelectric couplings um, to double parametric couplings that are being pursued. And one can always tell a little bit the status of the field by the range of things that people are looking at to solve a problem. And I think you and you could probably comment on how large you think that range is and uh, <laughs> where things are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think uh, for sure we see that people are are now, you know, trying basically everything, uh, all different kinds of, of platforms, different kinds of mechanical resonators, throwing all of these ideas at, at this problem, uh, which is really quite challenging. Um, and, you know, as Cindy mentioned, there have been many, uh, many recent um, developments. I think, you know, for example, as Cindy mentioned, the experiment by Oscar Painter, um, I should point out though, that in that experiment, I would say that, um, you know, What's been shown is that you can use optical signal to read out the state of a qubit. Um, but for example, one important figure of merit is the efficiency. And there, I think the efficiency was too low for them to actually show that the photons had a quantum nature, right? So in some sense, they're, they're detecting photons, right? But they're not single photons converted from the, from the qubit excitation. So I, I, there are many subtleties there, right? And there are all these different figures of merit. Um, and, and there's, you know, in many systems of trade-off, for example, between 
uh, um, you know, the efficiency and, and the, the noise that is added. And so, you know, because there are so many sometimes seemingly conflicting requirements, right? Um, you, I, I think it's important to just, you know, explore new types of platforms, new types of mechanical resonators. And as we mentioned before, you know, maybe the way to go is not even using a mechanical resonator, maybe direct electro-optical conversion um, will be uh, the way to go. But uh, I think, yeah, there are a lot of people working very hard uh, on this. So I, I think there will be at least some new developments to come soon. So, so would you say it's kind of some time off until you can, until you can actually use this? Or are they, are they already useful devices that- I, I would say that- yeah, I, I would say that for the purposes of actually, you know, transmitting a quantum signal, keeping its quantum uh, properties and, and using it, for example, you know, to transmit that information between you know, two quantum processors, I think we are still, we're not at that point yet. Um, now, there are actually other interesting applications that have grown out of this field. For example, there have this idea of using light, using optical light to actually read out super systems. Um, there, there was a recent paper um, uh, uh, from NIST, if I remember correctly, um, saying that you know this is this could be advan uh, an advantage for surrounding circuits because optical fibers have less thermal conductivity than you know RF cables. Mm -hmm. So maybe you want to put those in your fridge instead of RF lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, you know, again, right? Like you have this problem, but then people try to solve it, and then the solutions, the partial solutions, become useful for other things as usual. So yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you. that example is very much a, you know, how do you replace your cable with something that's more like a, a fiber optic link? But in terms of, you know, maybe one way to give you a sense of the state of the field is different benchmarks that one might want to have are, like you once said, you know, having a, a single photon source that you can actually show as a single photon source, um, not destroying the state of your, of your qubit when you apply light to your system. Um, showing any sort of entanglement, um, even in a continuous variables regime between a microwave and optical signal, um, all of those things have not been done. Um, so we talk about these systems as a potential way to solve this problem, but, but there's really a lot of benchmarks that um, have not been yet met left in the field. Um, so it makes it exciting, um, but it's also, a, you know, notably, like every quantum problem, it's uh, pretty hard. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I see that James has his hand up. I do have my hand up. Thank you. Um, I have so many questions after this panel discussion, but I, I'll keep it to one. Uh, I hope it has a, a suitable level of um, coherence. Um, so, I mean, it seems clear kind of from a classical level, even intuitively, that you might want to build a hybrid system to uh, play off the strengths of, of different, the strengths and the weaknesses of different systems. Is it naive to always take that description over into the quantum regime? Um, uh, or does anyone want to comment on anything about the, the challenges of, of just saying, you know, oh, you know, states in a mechanical oscillator are very long lived, but, uh, you know, you get a very strong coupling with a qubit or something. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Or it, or it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think the, the, I mean, the, the thing, okay, uh, if, if people introduce this uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid quantum system in general, they, they argue about their combining strengths and, and winning weaknesses. Um, I think that's always the, the idea. I think in practice, it hardly ever turns out to be the case. So you can, <laughs> you're in the experiment, you know, simply then uh, encounter all the weaknesses and, and even more that you had in a single system. Um, so I think that that's why it's, it's certainly not a, a general principle that, it, that you can, can claim. And I would say that maybe so far in many cases, yeah, it really turns out to be super hard. So, I mean, I've uh, been on from the theory side and in this, uh, some of the early proposals and yeah, and it, it's uh, always turned out to be uh, very hard, tricky to, to implement them. But um, yeah, but on the other hand, I would say that also there are specific examples and, and, and yeah, even so, when, I mean, with these bulk acoustic resonators and so on, which then, 
uh, I would say uh, you can really now combine this, the strength of a superconducting qubit and the strength of a, of a, of a mechanical mode. Uh, but I would probably say, say it's not, not a general principle case. Okay? So you have to be, <laughs> in specific cases, it can work out. Thank you. Did that answer your question, James? Uh, but but maybe, maybe uh, so nobody else jumps in. I mean, uh, but but in some cases, you know, we also don't have an alternative. Okay, so for for I mean, superconducting optics can uh, I mean, there's electro optics, but the, often there's just no direct way. Okay, so you have to introduce additional elements. So as, as I mentioned before, I mean, coupling spin qubits. I mean, it's not easy. They don't talk to each other directly, so their mechanics, even if it's not as simple as one uh, thinks initially. Uh, also, the alternatives are not not really there. Okay, so you have to go somehow hybrid. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Well, perhaps if we have time, we can return to you later, James. Yeah. Uh, for now, I'm going to read a question from the chat um, from Sophia Crawford. Um, right. Yes. Yeah, so this is a good question because it complements the one I asked about experimental challenges earlier. Um, what are some of the outstanding theoretical challenges for hybrid optomechanics, perhaps in terms of modeling these systems and the way they interact? So maybe I can start. So I think there was something uh, that uh, Peter started uh, commenting on, which I think is quite important. That is kind of the disorder aspect. So if we have a standard cavity optomechanical system, yeah, uh, we don't really care so much whether the optical cavity sits exactly at your nominal design frequency or slightly off, because you can always change the laser frequency and the detuning and make it all match up. So, so that's simple enough. But as soon as you have more degrees of freedom in the mix, so the same also applies to multi-mode systems in general, uh, that's no longer true. Then you need a sufficiently large uh, degree of tunability uh, either. That would be maybe more a question for the experiments. Or we probably on the theory side need to think about uh, smart protocols that are kind of robust against these uh, small changes. Maybe things inspired by topology or um, uh, some certain quantum optics uh, protocols that are known to be kind of uh, robust and say state transfer. And I think that is probably an important point I would say for hybrid uh, systems to become more robust to have schemes, to invent schemes that are more robust to these unavoidable uh, non-idealities in the parameters. Yeah, that sounds good. Did you have an answer as well, Peter? Yeah, maybe just one aspect. Okay, I mean, it's it's of course hybrid systems. You have to, in principle, know about multiple systems at, at the same time. Okay, it's, it's not uh, um, you usually never ex expert on, on 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 all the details. You have different materials, different type of physical process going on. Uh, but I think also one one aspect that I think kind of came up in the previous discussion is is about you have a lot of uh, design. Flexible freedom, uh, and you know. So, if, as we think about these optomechanical transducers, we have heard about you know that people do it in the megahertz regime, maybe kilohertz regime, up to the gigahertz regime. And now, if you want to design, think about the question: What is the optimal design? Or even as a theorist, to, to estimate some parameters, you know, it's, it's often you know where do we start? Okay, so there are so many uh, parameters that, that, that come into play. So, just optimizing this, this transducer. I mean, you could think about that's. If everybody sits together and it works out what is the optimal design, come up with a solution, but there's simply so, such a huge parameter space. And uh, then, of course, a lot of unknowns. So I think that that's also something that, that uh, this in terms of, of, of pure modeling or, or designing experiments, um, yeah, there is simply so much space to explore. And that's why we also have the, all these different 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 uh, ways to approach this problem, uh, which have, it's of course good, but yeah, it adds the more de degrees of freedom we have, the more flexibility you have. And that's certainly one aspect here. Uh, 
I, I actually have to head out um, to my next meeting. I'm sorry, um, but you guys, please continue without me. Thanks again for having me. Thank you very much for participating. All right, bye-bye. Uh, good. Right, well, we, um, we do in principle have some more time. However, I think that we've actually run out of questions from the, from the chat. Um, however, I see that James has a hand up, which is excellent. So perhaps we can have a, another question from here. No, I haven't um, run out then. of questions. <laughs> okay, go ahead, James. <laughs> Sorry. Um, maybe I'll inspire some other ones. Um, okay, again, maybe a slightly weird question, but are there any two, or is there a hybrid system that you can, ima well, imagine, but as of yet, we don't know how to couple those two systems. That so would be a dream for you. Or do we know how to couple everything to everything? I think Peter has brought up a number of times the, um, the coupling to spin systems, which, which I think is, you know, and brought up the notion that it, it's really very difficult to couple them. And there are only so many options, right? And, and mechanical systems are, are certainly one of them. Um, so I, I certainly find these coupling mechanical systems to spin degrees of freedom in the solid state, very intriguing, intriguing you know, both electron spins and, and nuclear spins. Um, so personally, I put that in an area of big challenge because of the couplings, um, but also sort of a, a set in, uh, or a toolbox that you might not otherwise have, right? Uh, so that's a pretty vague answer um, to your question, but I wanted to sort of lay it out there that the spin systems I think are a pretty interesting frontier, um, though a hard one. Yeah, and maybe you can add here, um, you know, uh, gravity. So if you want to grow gravity, okay, gravity has to couple something and there, yeah, of course the idea is to, to use masses, uh, big masses, big mechanical systems. And I think here also the, yeah, I mean, the dark matter searches, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think the other degrees of freedom they, they may couple to, but uh, I think in terms of gravity, uh, I think still having mechanical systems and then optics attached to it or other uh, type of quantum system attached to it to read them out and prepare superposition states. I think here, I think here mechanics is still pretty unique. So it's... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I just, I can see the, the challenge being... And, and also fascinating being like the potential to couple some extremely low frequency system to, to a quantum system. I mean, just the engineering challenge is, is a nightmare because low frequency is a pain. But um, yeah. Okay, I see Peter has his hand up again. Yeah, hi. Um, I, so yeah, so I, uh, can your video can't be. Anyway, I, can, I can't stop my video, so you will have to do it about my face. Um, so what I wanted to know is, can, you know, so, I mean, obviously optomechanics have been around for some time now, and I guess also has, you know, hybrid optomechanics. Are there really any, you know, do you know of any really successful systems that have made their way to any commercial applications? And, and is that likely in the future? I mean, I know it's not necessarily, you know, something that necessarily you guys have been looking at, but, you know, you know, just in your sort of experience in the area, has that been happening? I mean, it's a, it's a fine line what defines an optomechanical system at, at some level. I mean, you could say that precursors to what we're doing um, are already something that people use all the time, like an AFM, right? Or a, feedback damping loop in an AFM. Sure, um, sure. You know, that's very connected, but obviously didn't come out of our field studying the automatic <laughs> Hamiltonian <laughs> um, yeah. in the last number of years. Uh, so, so I think that it's important to recognize there are connections, um, but I jumped into this because <laughs> I don't have an answer to somebody who's commercialized um, something that's uh, come out of like ground state cooling or mechanical because mm. I guess, you know, they're mostly classical things, which is still very useful. But, um, yeah, so, you know, I just, I, I, I don't know many applications. Yeah, maybe and, Peter or Florian, if you had ideas. So. Yeah. 
Was it, you going to say something for it? No, so um, I remember Oscar's patent on the accelerometer, the optomechanical accelerometer, but I, that's not quantum, okay, fine. <laughs> but I don't know where this went, but that sounded at the time like something very close to <laughs> applications. Yeah, I yeah. guess the potential they move off the radar once they moved into a commercial sphere. Right, and, and that, that I would say that paper is yeah, sort of more about the mechanical design, right? That, uh, um, but, but that feeds back you know, and a lot of the things that have happened in the optomechanics field, right? In terms of careful understanding of mechanical systems, good ways to measure them, right? I, I, I like to think that there's mechanical things vibrating all over the place all the time. <laughs> yes. um, and what we're good at is extracting information. Um, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. Well, I propose, oh, uh, we have a question from, from the chat, probably a, possibly a last question. Um, I think one restriction of optomechanical systems is their limit robustness against external effects. And as a result, this limits uh, their utility to practical applications. Can hybrid optomechanicals help to overcome that limitation? So, so I would rather say that the standard optomechanical system, I would consider a fairly robust system. It's so simple and you have a few control knobs in situ that, that I would consider relatively robust, at least in the classical regime. And the danger is rather that with the hybrid component, you, you introduce the uh, sensitivity to noise, but maybe others want to comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. There are a couple of comments um, from the YouTube chat that I guess probably everybody on the call can read. Um, I don't know whether anybody on the panel wants to uh, wants to comment on either of these. So one is about uh, decoupling mass from gravity is the killer app, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> that is certainly true, yes. I wouldn't argue with that. Um, yeah, it would also violate the equivalence principle. Um, yes, okay, the other YouTube question is, is it fair to describe the smallest unit of empty space as a qubit? This I can answer no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Peter. <laughs> Great. Well, okay, I think, uh, yes, it's time to applaud all of our panel members. So thank you very much for a really interesting discussion um, for uh, some, some uh, really uh, creative, you know, some great answers to the, uh, to the fairly, uh, to the somewhat bland questions I asked and the more interesting questions from the audience. Um, so uh, with that, I will pass us back to Marcus. Thank you very much, Edward. Uh, thank you all, Flora and Peter, Cindy and Ivan for this awesome panel and the exciting questions and inspiring ideas. Um, thank you, Edward, for moderating it. Uh, thank you, audience, for joining. And uh, please uh, visit uh, us on our researchseminars.org website for our upcoming seminars or join our uh, mailing list via the link uh, I just posted in the chat. And I hope to see you all soon in November for our next block of seminars. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Edward. Right. Thanks a lot. <laughs>